Uh, well, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is our first webinar of 2024 of United Partners Network. UPN is a great international community of PR and marketing agencies. We are united for growth. And we believe then that when we grow, our clients grow, our agencies grow. So we hope that this webinar will be of a great value for your professional growth and uh, your uh, knowledge upgrade in the field of AI regulations. As AI is becoming part of our everyday life and everyday business, I believe that we all uh, need to know what's happening and what's coming next. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to share that this webinar is a joint uh, effort uh, of uh, United Partners and uh, Dell uh, based in Washington, D.C., which is just next door to the White House. And UP is uh, mainly delivering clients across Europe. The political, legislative and regulatory landscape are always evolving and Delph are here to help to make sense of all it. So now it's a great pleasure for me to announce the speakers today. We will have uh, Eva Maidel, uh, who is the member of the European Parliament and one of the lead negotiators of the Artificial Intelligence Act. She is today in Davos, so she has recorded a video that will share with us the latest updates of the um, reg regulations uh, in the AI uh, field. Uh, also, we have our great partners here, Jeff Berkowitz, uh, founder and CEO of Delft, and Kyle Hua, a lead AI analyst at Delft. We will start with a very short video update from Eva Maidel, followed by the presentation by Jeff and Kyle. So um, now you will see the video first. Dear participants in this webinar, uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to be here with you today during such an exciting moment for global AI governance. I'm grateful to Delve and UPN for organizing this online gathering. Unfortunately, due to participating in the World Economic Forum's annual meeting uh, in Davos this week, I could not join you live, but I hope to be able to do so at another occasion. I wanted to start by summarizing what the European Union's planned AI law sets out to be, how it evolved and what it has become. So first, what is set out to be? The AI Act was released in 2021, way before all the hype we got around AI and ChatGPT in particular. This law is the world's first ever general law on AI. It is horizontal, meaning it covers all sectors, and it utilizes a sort of a pyramid approach, ranging from prohibited practices to low-risk practices, uh, which do not need to be uh, regulated. Of particular interest is the high-risk uh, uh, criteria, which regulates uh, risky use cases like biometric facial recognition, uh, topics related to migration or credit assessments, employment uh, and uh, education. Second, I want to emphasize on the point how the AI Act evolved. When the initial AI Act was presented back in 2021, we had not seen many of the breakthroughs that we are seeing today. With the AI race heating up, we have seen the debate around foundational models in particular and generative AI to intensify. So we responded by introducing new text addressing these changes. Thirdly, I want to focus on what we made out of the AI Act and what it became. So on the guardrail side, we have included plenty of measures to protect citizens in the truly high risk uh, category, in the truly high risk use cases when it comes to the areas of banking or education, workplace, uh, job security, uh, more social topics. Uh, and we have also included several measures to protect our democracies uh, when it comes to deepfakes and uh, generated content. 
Moreover, we pushed for various innovation promoting measures such as uh, the introduction of regulatory sandboxes, uh, research and open source exemptions and also improved measures for smaller um, and medium-sized companies and particularly startups are part of this final version of the law. Overall, I'm fairly happy with the text we've agreed on after 38 hours of intense negotiations. Uh, however, we need to be sober because the European Union is far from having finished all its legislative work on the AI. First, it is worth, worth noting that it was the key political agreement until this moment, but the final texts are still being finalized and will be available in the coming weeks. Once this is done, uh, we will adopt it formally at the European Parliament by a vote in our plenary and also the Council side member states will have to do that. What follows then is that the entry into force would begin in six months after uh, being voted for the prohibited and banned practices. It would be 12 months uh, after being voted to enter into force for general purpose AI systems, two years uh, after for most high risk applications and three years after for uh, high risk applications that are already heavily covered by other sectorial legislation. Um, What's very important uh, for the next steps is that, secondly, it's the sound implementation of our new rules, uh, because this is not a given fact. Uh, proper guidelines, standards, uh, and so on will be key to su the successful implementation. And I'm very much hoping that the AI office, which we have called for to be set up in this new uh, law, will be very helpful in this regard. Finally, uh, in the next steps, what's important is that the European Union can still benefit from a more ambitious strategy to foster AI excellence in Europe. I have long called for more strategic legislation like the CHIPS Act or uh, through more investments in research, through completion the capital markets union or the creation of a tech sovereign fund. And I think these are all important areas to watch and to continue striving and working for. Having said that, I wish you a successful meeting and webinar, and I look forward to staying in touch. So I will give the floor here now to Jeff and Kyle to deep dive into the, um, this very complicated field of AI regulations and uh, feel free to post your questions in the chat and after their deep dive we will have time for Q&A. Thanks, thanks Maria and, and really appreciate uh, you organizing this. Uh, it's, it's a very exciting time um, to have this conversation and as a uh, member of European Parliament Maydell mentioned uh, this is a, the AI is a very horizontal thing. It's going to go across um, every jurisdiction um, and every sector. And so uh, we're excited to, to dive in a little bit on what we're, we're seeing. Uh, but first, just to, to help you understand where we're coming from, Delve is a, a competitive intelligence and risk advisory firm. Uh, and we're really built to help public affairs professionals understand what's what's happening in the political and policy landscape, who's shaping it, which stakeholders can they work with, and and whose efforts are they going to have to overcome. And and I, I can't confirm or deny whether that's our real office, but that's what AI thought it looked like. Uh, so I thought, thought that was a, a fun way to start things off uh, using AI. Um, we've really dove deep in the past year into AI. And uh, you know, looking at how it's going to impact um, a range of, of sectors. And that started for us with um, really with diving into the key jurisdictions that are going to drive that, um, beginning with a risk assessment across what's happening in Washington um, and looking at, at, at what's sort of driving the thinking on AI. And, and I wanna give you some context so that when Kyle dives into what we're watching for 2024, you, you have a good uh, foundation for that understanding. Um, key, uh, you know, so one of the things that we really noticed at, in the last year with policymakers is um, 
AI has reached it reached its inflection point where it's gotten this big notice at a time when lawmakers are really both in the U.S., Europe, and elsewhere are really feeling like they were behind the curve on regulating and putting in the kinds of guardrails they wanted on uh, uh, social media and other technology. There was, you know, we the last few years you were seeing this conversation around tech lash. Um, and so it was in that context that lawmakers started looking at AI and, and there's this feeling uh, amongst them that they that they want to make up for their their failures in the past in the last battle and really be ahead of the curve in regulating uh, AI and and uh, even if it means it, it hampers some innovation um, and. Uh, while Congress has taken in last year a, a surprisingly uh, humble approach to holding listening sessions, trying to get smart on AI, it's the only uh, topic in Washington that I know when you talk to uh, congressional staff, uh, they actually want you to introduce them to, to your, your clients so they can understand what they're doing and, and how it impacts the different sectors. Um, since they've been listening and learning, the Biden administration has not been acting, as they ha has not been waiting uh, to act. Um, they have taken the, what they call a whole of government approach. It's similar to the whole of government approach they've taken to climate change and and, uh, and, and COVID and, and other um, crypto, other big key interagency um, undertakings, and that's that's meant um, agencies taking existing authorities and starting to do enforcement action, writing rules for AI based on what they they already have as authorities. And of course, uh, towards the end of last year, the President Biden signing uh, one of the longest executive orders um, in the history of executive orders, uh, detailing a, a broad range of actions he wants to see federal agencies take uh, on AI, uh, including evoking the Defense Production Act, um, uh, although as far as I know, we're not at war with the robots yet um, and and sort of tackling a lot of those issues that, that Kyle will dive into. Meanwhile, across the the U.S. state, you know, state capitals um, have been moving much faster than Washington. Um, they were already um, doing a lot of, of action around regulating technology, whether it was content moderation on social media, most many states have passed privacy data privacy laws, which Washington has not. You know, EU has it. Uh, a lot of states, you know, um, use that framework uh, to build on. Um, you know, and prospects for federal pri privacy law in the U.S. are are uh, remain dim. Um, but state state lawmakers have moved ahead on that, uh, and it's been in a lot of ways a bipartisan um, interest. Uh, across states, as well as um, not just st state lawmakers, but state elected officials like attorney generals and others have been using their enforcement mechanisms and regulatory authorities um, to really dive in on, on uh, what can be done on technology in general and, and what that means for AI in the areas of competition and, and many others that, that Kyle will dive into. Um, one thing I will say is the way state legislatures work, many of them are part-time, have short sessions. Um, some of them don't even meet, only meet every other year. And so the window for making legislation last year was in introducing legislation was, was largely closed in a lot of states um, before AI really got the attention of lawmakers, regulators. So there's a lot of pent up interest that we're going to see unfold this year in a tidal wave of, of bills across the, the the states. Meanwhile, in Europe, as, as many of you, you know, uh, European lawmakers have have been at the forefront of regulating technology long before AI came along you know, with GDPR, the Digital Markets Act, Digital Services Act. So there's a lot of frameworks for them to build on. And uh, as as uh, uh, you know, member of European Parliament, Maydell mentioned uh, the EU institutions were already deep into developing the AI Act when generative AI surprised the world uh, just over a year ago. Um, and so they had to adjust and update what they were working on and how they were thinking about AI, um, you know, in the AI Act, but it put them um, ahead of the game, um, which has many uh, of us who watch policy and regulation, how it gets shaped and influenced and evolves across uh, jurisdictions across the world, 
uh, wondering how the Brussels effect is going to impact AI policymaking. You, you, we saw that with privacy and some of the other big debates where things that, that began in Brussels kind of spread into other jurisdictions, influencing how different state capitals and, and other uh, national governments have, have adopted that. And even if they haven't, you know, tech, tech companies have had to adapt um, to, to addressing some of those compliance issues in Europe. So they've just done so more globally. Um, so with that, you know, sort of quick catch up, you know, one of the things we've been doing since we built out those uh, deep dive risk assessments this past uh, spring and summer is tracking on a daily basis what's happening with the, the AI policy debate in Washington, state capitals, Brussels, London, um, and, and, and elsewhere across you know, key EU member states and, and elsewhere around the world. Um, not just what are policymakers saying, but what are all the different stakeholders shaping the debate saying? And so, uh, what Kyle's going to you know, share with you is based on all of all of what we've been watching over the past few months. Uh, what are what are we seeing and, and thinking about as those key trends uh, for twenty twenty four? And with that, I'll turn it over to Kyle. Awesome, <clears throat> thank you, Jeff. Yeah, so Jeff, as you mentioned, you know, we've been tracking all of these issues and we have five key trends that we're looking at this year in the AI space. And we'll we'll start here with the looking at the United States and specifically the first trend. We think that this is going to be the year of AI agency action, especially because as Jeff mentioned, you know, Congress was listening, they're shifting now to legislating but we don't expect many legislative uh, pathways, many um, much legislative success to come from that. And so we're really looking at agencies, both at the federal and state level, potentially leaping forward and taking charge and trying to address AI regulation on their own. So of course, as Jeff mentioned, right, Congress was listening last year, the Senate held listening sessions, the House as well. We think that there, there will be some committee work on AI issues. There may be a larger framework from Majority Leader Schumer. There, there, there will certainly be a number of individual bills. A number of bills have been introduced in the past Congress um, already, last year already, up to 164. We expect there to be a lot more uh, you know, covering issues from privacy to discrimination to liability. But the key to remember with Congress in Washington, D.C. is that there just aren't a lot of vehicles for these bills to move forward with. Uh, it's an election year here in, in the U.S. There's been historic gridlock on tech issues. So we don't necessarily think there will be big AI bills moving forward. Maybe a few things we should definitely keep, keep your eye on, uh, things that will influence legislation in the future. But because of this uh, potential lack of legislation in Congress, uh, we really think that federal agencies, state agencies as well, will will jump in and tackle a lot of these AI issues. Of course, President Biden signed his executive order last November. Uh, that order directed 23 federal agencies to do various things on AI, um, plus, plus some directives for all of the federal agencies. So we'll have agencies around Washington issuing new guidance, standards, uh, setting new rules for federal procurement. And so uh, we'll see a lot of that. There's a lot of agencies in Washington that, as Jeff mentioned, have already been using their existing authority to enforce restrictions on AI tools. A lot of this comes in the space of discrimination, potential discrimination caused by AI tools in these different um, these different regulatory sectors. So these agencies we think will continue to be working um, on AI, AI rules and guidance and enforcement. Also state agencies, a new battleground. We think they'll become, some have already been active like in California, There's there've been some AI rules proposed already. Uh, there've been some rules proposed by insurance commissions at the state level, but we think state agencies will continue to be active, especially as states pass their own AI bills in the upcoming session. Keeping, uh, you know, one, well, one of the justifications for at least a lot of the federal rulemaking or, or guidance or enforcement is going to be national security. Agencies will turn to this, especially, of course, the Department of Commerce, which is working to prevent the export of advanced AI chips to China. 
Um, that, that's, of course, also going on in Europe at the same time. But national security will be a justification for a lot of the agency work that happens this year. And of course, it's also worth noting that there are some independent agencies. They're, they're more independent from the White House, but they have uh, appointees that have, they have um, leaders that have been appointed by the Biden administration. They'll be particularly ambitious in trying to enforce rules uh, on AI and trying to enforce rules on the use of AI tools, um, particularly like the Federal Trade Commission, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, right? both the leaders at both of those agencies have expressed concern about competition, uh, protecting consumers from AI tools. So we're definitely watching these independent agencies. Moving now to the state level, uh, we expect to see, a t as Jeff mentioned, potentially a tidal wave of legislation at the state level addressing AI issues, um, also potentially some broader frameworks that legislators are working on together. And that's because, in part because a Connecticut senator, James Maroney, he did a lot on data privacy. He'll be, uh, he's worked to organize members of legislatures from around the United States, representing more than 30 states. There are more than 100 legislators in this group. They've come together. They're working on AI legislation that we could see pop up in multiple state legislatures. We also expect just a number of bills to be introduced this year. There were 191 AI bills in this in state legislatures last year in 2023. We expect a lot more uh, in this coming session. Uh, we've already seen we're going to completely probably blow past this number uh, at the state level in terms of AI bills that are introduced uh, from what we've seen so far this year. This is just a smattering of examples of what's already been introduced. There's things from regulating deep fakes in elections to broader bills regulating generative AI developers. Uh, really, really a lot going on here. I, I won't go into too much detail, but before we, you know, it, it's also worth noting that at the state level, you know, at the federal level as well, there could be some difference in the partisan approach some difference between how the parties think about addressing AI. Democrats tend to be a little more interested in bills focusing on things like discrimination and bias and election disinformation. Republicans will probably uh, have more interest in data privacy bills and social media regulation, both of which may not be directly focused on AI, but they definitely touch AI issues since AI is used in those different, uh, is, you know, it, is, is connected to those issues or, or used sometimes in social media and in content moderation. So keeping an eye on those different approaches between the parties. And then there's also another new battleground across, across the United States, which are courtrooms. Uh, we, of course, you've probably heard about some of the intellectual property related court cases uh, touching on AI, we're we're watching those because that could shape how AI companies are how they can train their models. Since they need training data, they need um, you know quality training data from from various sources. That's why we see the New York Times, for instance, suing OpenAI a few weeks ago. There could be defamation cases, and and as Jeff mentioned, uh, states attorneys state attorneys general have been very active on tech issues in the past. And it wouldn't be surprising for them to jump in and be active on AI issues in the future, especially when it comes to things like consumer protection, competition, uh, and, and keep in mind those state, state attorneys general, because they've been working together, they've been working in a bipartisan fashion, uh, bringing cases against big tech companies. They have experience, they have the institutional knowledge, they have the connections with officials across states to come together for more multi-state cases potentially against AI companies. So that's the landscape in the United States, but let's now jump across the pond to Europe. And, uh, you know, as, as MEP Maydell mentioned, right, the AI Act is nearing completion, um, but it is provisional. There's, there's still a little bit of tension among member states regarding what that final text should look like, how those regulations should, should look. And, and it's worth keeping in mind also in, into the long run as we think about the implementation of the AI Act and future AI bills, that there could be a change in the sort of political composition of parliament 
um, that that could also change the flavor of lawmaking in Brussels a bit. So let's dive into that. And and before we we, we get too far, I just want to run through again a, a quick outline of the AI Act and and uh, MEP Maydell, of course, eloquently explained this, but but just to refresh, right? It's the AI Act is focused on regulating AI based on its use case and based on how risky that use case is. And so, of course, there are some use cases that, that are just unacceptable. They're, they're completely banned, things like social scoring, um, predictive policing, emotion recognition, a, a lot of real-time facial recognition. Uh, and then there are high-risk use cases. These aren't banned, but they're heavily regulated. They require a lot of accountability by regulators. And these are things like AI used in education, AI used in employment purposes or regarding public benefits. And then of course, next level are some limited risk cases like chat bots that need to disclose that they're chat bots. Um, and, and then everything else that we, that we sometimes don't even think is actually an AI use case is in the minimal risk category. So this is for, you know, for instance, the, the AI act isn't going to regulate how the AI in your toaster works. And so, so we have those different risk categories, and then there, then there are specific rules for general purpose AI models. And, and these rules were, of course, added in by Parliament this last year when generative AI chatbots rose to prominence. Um, they've also been the source of some of the tension that we've been seeing around the AI Act. And the point of these rules, of course, is to, is to require you know your, your chatbots like ChatGPT or like Mistral, Mistral's chatbots or um, generative AI image generators uh, to have more rules, to have more disclosure requirements, and and more um, accountability with regulators. So. As, as the, the member of parliament mentioned, uh, the, the agreement on these rules, the, the outline that I just described, of course, it's, it is provisional and, and there's been some pushback against, against that language that we've seen from some of the larger states in the EU. President Macron has been a bit critical, um, also Germany and Italy, um, as well as Poland, Hungary and, and Finland have all said in some some way, shape or form that they don't necessarily want to agree to the final agreement until they've seen the final text, uh, which is still in process. Those technical details are still being worked out. So um, we're still watching to see uh, what these states maybe want or how they want to reshape some of the technical details, especially on the uh, general purpose of intelligence. And the reason why some of these states especially France, is particularly, um, has been somewhat critical of prescriptive rules on general purpose AI is because uh, President Macron and others really want to see a homegrown domestic European artificial intelligence industry that can potentially compete with the United States, potentially compete with China. And at the heart of that industry, of course, are, are two generative AI companies in Europe right now, Aleph Alpha, and Mistral in Paris. It's also worth noting there's a number of generative AI startups in Europe. And so these companies are, you know, in part, I think, motivating a little bit of the tension around just how prescriptive those rules should be uh, in the AI Act. Of course, you know, if even if and, and when the AI Act is adopted in the next few weeks, um, it still is a, a long road to implementing it fully. There's still a lot of technical details to be ironed out. And in that time, of course, there could be continued conversations among stakeholders, among EU member state leaders and the EU commission and regulators as they, as they step in and make those rules more concrete. Also, it's possible that um, member state leaders, you know, President Macron, others um, who who have concerns, you know, that they they could uh, they could potentially um, those concerns could motivate additional legislation um, on top of the AI Act, touching on other issues. Um, it's also worth noting that the enforcement of the AI Act is going to depend on EU member states appointing their own regulatory bodies. Um, who they choose as those regulatory bodies could at some level kind of change the, the um, enforcement approach or strategy 
uh, in different member states. So we're definitely keeping an eye on all of that and um, on some of those uh, sort of tensions and conversations between stakeholders, between industry, member states, parliament, as we go forward with the AI Act. It's also worth noting, of course, that there's a major election in Europe this year. The uh, European Parliament elections will be this summer, and there are projections that the populist right-wing parties, uh, the, the ECR and the ID, could increase their number of seats in Parliament. Um, it's not projected, of course, that that they'll they'll join the ruling coalition or or have a majority right. We'll, we'll probably see the, the same majority among the center left, center, and center right party uh, that, that we currently have. But it's it's worth noting that this rise of of populism could potentially shift the flavor of lawmaking in Brussels a little bit. The question is, well, what? what would far-right parties actually want when it comes to AI? Well, uh, we, we have at least one indication from Italian Prime Minister Georgia Maloney, right? She's very concerned about the impact of AI on the labor market, on workers, uh, about workers being complete replaced by AI. Um, you know, side note, of course, Italy will be running the G7 this uh, this year, and so they'll make, they plan to make AI very much a, a central part of that, and labor issues, of course, central to that also. But that, that's just one area where, where populists, if they were to gain a little more traction in Brussels, might push um, AI just lawmaking or, or regulatory action towards um, also potentially things like, uh, like consumer privacy, um, pr privacy from, from AI in public, public spaces, um, that sort of thing. Before leaving the European jurisdiction, it's important to note that there's another big election this year in Europe, and that's in the UK, uh, or at least before January 2025, we'll see an election in the UK. UK Prime Minister Rishi Sunak has really staked his legacy on AI. He wants London to be a hub for the AI industry, and uh, he wants the UK to be a, a, a hub for AI uh, global regulatory guidance and leadership as well. Um, this, of course, may not, this legacy may not be enough to make up the gap between his conservative party that you see there in blue and the, the opposition party, Labour, uh, which currently is at 44%. You know, it's, it's a pretty big gap in the polls right now. Um, it's unlikely, I think, because of this gap that we would see some sort of major AI legislation or omnibus bill introduced by the Conservative Party in the UK this year, just because that bill would be contentious and potentially the very companies that, that the Prime Minister wants to locate in London would be discouraged from locating there if there was some sort of prescriptive, prescriptive regulation on AI. However, if the Conservative Party doesn't win the election and the Labour Party does, it's likely Labour will take a different tack on AI that, that is indeed more prescriptive, that is more interested in regulating some of those powerful AI models. At least that is what the party has said in response to the ruling Conservative Party's lighter touch approach in London right now. So, Stepping back from specific jurisdictions, uh, our fourth point and our fourth point is, is essentially focused on the tech se sector. And we're zooming in and, and thinking about some of the splintering that's happened in that sector, um, different philosophies that have arisen uh, and, and the tech center's efforts to influence public policy making. And, and the key point here is that there's been a lot of scrutiny around some of those efforts. So let's just look first at what are these divides in the sec tech sector that we're looking at. Um, we've a lot of us, you know, have probably followed some of this open source debate between parts of the tech sector. Some companies are um, focused on the on uh, designing models that are open source, meaning you have access to certain details about the models and how they work. Mistral, Meta are both on the open source side of things. OpenAI and Google and others are much more closed. They don't want those model details to be released. Some of this is a national security matter for them. They're concerned about uh, models falling into the wrong hands. There's also um, differences in the tech sector around whether models should be licensed, whether uh, 
whether companies should have to, to seek licensing to produce really powerful AI models. There's been a big debate around existential risk, which is to say how dangerous are the most advanced AI models and do steps need to be taken to prevent those models from putting humanity at risk for some sort of, um, in some sort of existential way. There've been debates around how much immediate harms like discrimination and um, and privacy should be should be addressed right now in the moment, and whether those are how serious those are. There's debates around liability. Who's liable if an AI model goes awry? If if something goes wrong, and so so these are some of the divides, and and different parts of the tech industry are spending a lot of money uh, trying to influence policymakers in favor of their position on some of these issues. Uh, We've seen both in Washington and Europe uh, a lot of media scrutiny, though, when tech tries to win this influence. Um, you, you've probably followed a little bit about the effective altruists. That's a group that's very concerned about existential risk caused by AI. They've received a lot of attention for the money that they've been spending in Washington uh, from Politico. You can see a few of those articles here. But also, of course, there's been a lot of coverage of the tech industry's efforts to lobby on the EU's AI Act. Uh, in particular, there's been a split, and we saw this especially on the AI Act, uh, between model developers, right, generative AI model developers like Mistral based in Paris, right, that, that they think, and this is the CEO here saying that the deployer should bear the risk, right, the, the user of Mistral's chatbots should bear the responsibility for compliance to comply with, with the laws of, of the AI Act. So they're trying to kind of uh, push some of that regulatory compliance to users of their models the split here is that the users of those models, right, startups that maybe are building tools on top of them, um, they they would rather have some of that risk, some of that compliance borne by the generative AI model developers themselves, right? And so you, you see that split here. This is Jan Tallinn, who the founder of Skype, um, and Risto Uk, who uh, works for the Future of Life Institute in Europe, and so so we see that split. We've seen uh, you know. As, as different parts of the, of the tech world and different parts of the AI supply chain uh, wade into this debate. Of course, they're also going to draw scrutiny from media when they, if they, in terms of how they spend money, how they're trying to wield influence. Finally, point five, transparency. Uh, as more and more stakeholders are entering this AI debate, we think transparency will really be their weapon of choice. Now, Let's just look first of all at some of the emerging stakeholders. Some of these are existing stakeholders, but some of them are also new. Of course, privacy stakeholders in, in the US and Europe have, have been quite active for several years. They've led on some of this privacy legislation that we have in both jurisdictions, uh, you know, consumer rights uh, advocates as well. In, in AI, we're especially seeing a lot of civil rights advocacy groups. Um, emerge as stakeholders, as actors in this debate. They're particularly concerned about the impact that AI could have uh, on uh, on people in terms of bias and discrimination if the training data was that ca caused the model to be to be biased. There's also, of course, labor labor uh, groups have been particularly concerned, especially in Europe. Some labor advocacy organizations. Um, didn't think that the AI Act did enough to address labor issues. They asked for additional legislation. The European Commission, even even last summer, was was studying the issue to see if if maybe um, there was an avenue for for some sort of labor regulation. So we have all these emerging stakeholders, and they are getting a helping hand here in terms of of trying to hold AI companies accountable as the, as they'd like to see them held accountable with this release with a suite of different transparency provisions that we're seeing in a lot of the legislation around the, you know, in, in jurisdictions around the world, really, um, they, it, the, the different provisions go by different names and they, they do slightly different things, but they tend to have the same, the same function or the same desired outcome, which is, which is um, bringing more transparency into the into the uh, business operations, into the AI industry. So, you know, we have things like third-party audits, um, 
training data disclosure right is something that was that was um, proposed for the AI Act for generative AI models. Um, red teaming was proposed in the executive order that President Biden signed in November. Watermarks or disclosure, another thing required by the AI Act and required by a lot of proposed legislation in the United States, would require you know picture, images or text generated by artificial intelligence to be watermarked or or disclosed as AI so that people know when they're interacting with AI. And then, of course, impact assessments are also feature in the AI Act. Uh, conformity assessments feature in the AI Act. All, all of these uh, elements of, of uh, all these provisions of sort of, of, tr of transparency could potentially be used by stakeholders or regulators to expose problems among AI companies and, and point to issues in those companies, in those business practices. Um, stakeholders, even without formal transparency provisions, uh, a lot of advocacy groups have taken AI tools or models that are on the market and tried to stress test or pressure test them, see if they are biased, see if they reply with copyrighted content. Um, they're doing that pressure testing to, to expose problems in the models. And so anyone building an AI tool, using AI models in their workflow should be aware that, that there is this environment of transparency, both informal and formal, as we see more and more rules put on the books that are going to require them to expose parts of what they're doing. And of course, there, there, there will be a debate in any, any sort of legislative environment here. Um, but, but transparency is definitely going to be kind of the name of the game going forward that, um, that anyone in the AI space is going to have to be aware of. So, with that, I will turn it back to Jeff to wrap up. Thanks, Kyle. Um, and and uh, thanks for, for those of you who have been submitting questions. Uh, we'll get to those in, in a minute. Um, but I, you know, as you heard Kyle mention a few times, you know, there's this is a big election year across the, the world. Um, you know, more than 80 elections uh, are going to happen. Uh, some have already occurred, including Taiwan's this, this past week. Um, and, and that includes big elections in the U.S. and in Europe, in the U.K. Um, and that will both shape and distract from um, AI policymaking. But there are some key things beneath those um, uh election debates that that we think really bear watching given these trends that we've identified you know the first is you know we expect some you know we're watching to see if there is some sort of a federal agency action here in the us that actually forces ai agent uh, companies to change how they do business right so far what's been pro what's been proposed and done is you know has been voluntary and in coordination with a lot of those uh things um, you know, does that change this year? Is there something that an agency does or an enforcement action that that surprises folks? Second thing we're watching is that that state capital level, state legislatures in the U.S. move much faster than than Washington does on on a range of issues, including technology. Um, you know, S State Senator Maroney in Connecticut is leading this multi-state group. Um, if they come out with some big framework, when and, and what that looks like could have a huge impact on the, the regulatory and policy debate here in the U.S. and what that looks like. Um, in the EU, we're really watching, um, you know, what further member state concessions are required to actually get the AI Act passed, right? The, you know, once they see the final text, what concerns remain, what do they need addressed, you know, we expect there to be some some further debates, as you've seen with other big legislation, you know, the Fit for 50, Net Zero Industry Act, all of these things where there's been need, been uh, last minute uh, expectations from from certain member states uh, that that their particular concerns get addressed in order to make sure things can move forward. Um, so we're going to be watching watching that as well. And then with all these big elections happening, you know, what kind of scrutiny does Silicon Valley's influence game uh, get, you know, as technology companies in the U.S. and Europe uh, try and shape the, the debate on the campaign trail? 
how you know what it, you know how much how does that play out um and also given that that split uh between um you know large sort of almost very immediate incumbents uh companies developing these general models versus um you know developers of ai tools or other you know smaller startups had you know as well as that split between folks that view a lot of this as existential threat versus um you know manageable threat you know what how does that all play out? And lastly, what happens with transparency? And and given that transparency on AI developers and users, you know, how does that uh, does that impact just the big players or the small ones too? Right? If if smaller firms begin using AI tools more, what kind of regulatory frameworks do they have to adopt? And does that hinder their ability to to compete with some of the the bigger folks? So those are some of the the key things. Um, and, and, um, if you want to continue, uh, the debate, um, you know, following the debate, you can sign up, um, uh, uh, at delvin2.ai or scan the code. Um, and, and, you know, we do a daily email, uh, that's tracking this. There's a, a free version that gives you a couple high level things. And if you want to dive deeper, uh, there's a subscription as well. And, and, uh, would love to, to, um, tackle any questions that, um, you guys may have. Thank you so much, Jeff and Kyle. I think uh, it was extremely valuable, all the information that you shared and the insight and researches you have done. I think it's amazing what you have done so far. And we're looking forward to get, stay, stay in touch, be informed and see how this will develop. Obviously, this is going to be like a long ongoing process. And it's very important that we all follow up what's happening because it's going to impact many businesses. And it's very important to stay um informed and to know how and th how things are developing so we take the right actions well in advance so i see that there are a couple of questions already uh i will start with the first questions we will finish like the, like sharp in time so uh, we'll see uh we'll answer as many as we can and then if there's some left maybe we can answer uh, directly after that so how do um, do AI policies balance innovation with potential risks? You know, I, I think that's the question everyone's trying to answer, right? That's the, the billion dollar question, um, you know, and, and different jurisdictions are taking different approaches. You know, we see with the AI Act in Europe, you know, they're, they're taking, you know, very your risk management focused, um, you know, what's that risk level of the use case and, and, and trying to apply regulation that way, you know, the U S you know, is taking a little bit more balanced approach. Places like Singapore are, um, you know, are, are opening things up a little bit more towards the innovation side. Um, but I think the overall trend that we're seeing in the marketplace is that legislators and policymakers feel like they let, social media and technology in the 2000s and 2010s um, run, you know, too far and too fast without regulatory guardrails. And so um, I think this time around, whether it's the right answer or not, um, that's the approach that, you know, that that's informing the approach that regulators and policymakers are taking uh, across the board. And, and they're putting more guardrails um, in place. The other thing that's been really interesting is is you know, it, it's very typical to see sort of disruptors and innovators kind of grow and then over time they become more incumbent and start um, endorsing more regulatory frameworks now that they've kind of built the walled garden. I have AI that has happened faster with AI in some of these big companies um, than I think than than you typically see, and so you see OpenAI, you know, just Sam Altman, their CEO, called for. Light, you know, licensing of AI models and, and other things that, that most uh, early stage companies wouldn't uh, want. The question is, has that impact the, the founders of, of newer, earlier stage companies that are trying to innovate and disrupt the way some of these things are doing? And that's the balance that, that folks are going to have to figure out as this policy debate continues to unfold. Thank you. Uh Kyle, you have anything to add or shall I continue to the next question? I think Jeff covered it.
Yeah, okay. So the next question then is uh, how are legal frameworks adapting to AI challenges like bias? Like we already mentioned this, but still, and automation impact. So um, who's going to answer that? Yeah, well, you know, different frameworks have taken different approaches, of course. And in, in the EU, I think one of the ideas is that a lot of these high risk use cases that are heavily regulated are also use cases that that have greater risk of potentially causing discrimination or bias if the underlying if the model and its underlying data are biased. Um, and so those high risk use cases, of course, are, are regulated. There's requirements that that the that the tools be, you know, robust and um, uh, there's requirements around training data. So, so you know, the, the AI Act is trying to kind of tackle it that way. I think there's legislative proposals that see things like impact assessments that I mentioned as potential approaches to um, you know, requiring builders of AI tools to really test their tool and assess its potential impact before it goes to market and mitigate any potential concerns about bias or discrimination there. Um, you know, when it comes to, to automation, the impact of automation, I mean, I, I think that um, there have been some bills that we've seen in, in, in the U.S. at least um, regarding, regarding the automation of, of jobs and retraining workers, right, retraining the workforce. Um, there's also the question of, of um, uh, you know, using tools in the workplace and how that impacts workers in the workplace if there's AI tools being used to, to kind of monitor them. And so there's been some advocacy from labor organizations as well in terms of regulating the use of tools to monitor workers in the workplace. And so I think that, you know, it, it definitely varies by jurisdiction, um, but there are a lot of different policy approaches that, that, uh, that lawmakers have thought through on, on both bias and automation. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. The next question uh, is, which act is going to double check or fact check uh, or control the information used by LLMs models uh, in AI generative platforms? <laughs> he, he wants me to do all the hard ones. Uh, you know, I, I think the act is going to be uh, you and, and your computer. You know, it's this is, these are tools like any other. And I think this is the, you know, folks have to understand and develop a literacy, just like we did with the, you know, with the internet and the web more generally, a literacy around what AI can and, and can't do and what, what the models are, are doing, right? This is pattern recognition at scale trained on the data of the internet. So if you're, you're asking a, a question that there's a lot of thoughtful and good reliable information on the internet on you're probably going to get a really good answer if it's a, a heated or or issue or a very debatable one or, or more obscure you're probably going to get um, a, a less effective one um, but you know so you're going to you know i think users are going to have to get uh good at at double checking it you've already seen a few folks get themselves in trouble um, you know, a lawyer tried to use uh, general, you know, generative AI to to write his brief, and didn't realize that um, it had just made up a bunch of case precedents. It's, they sounded great, but they didn't actually exist. Um, you know, we we saw in some of our own experimentation, uh, we saw a uh, uh, we did a webinar actually on on AI uh, policy this this um, past uh, fall. And we fed, you know, the Fed Chat GPT the this, this transcript to get, you know, a nice summary built, and um, it recommended we add some direct quotes to, you know, to the to the blog post. Uh, and I said, great, you have the transcript, do it. And it made up quotes. Kyle, I sounded brilliant. We didn't actually say any of the things that they did. It, it represented the spirit. So, you know, you're going to have to understand what the technology can and can't do. And, and I think over time, it'll get better. It'll get better at having those guardrails and being fine tuned and trained and in, in some ways to make users. But I think, you know, that'll be a when it comes to government use for like public information chatbots and, you know, big companies or, or stakeholders that are engaged in public policy debates and other things, you're, you know, I think you're going to have to, you're going to see in the next year uh, a, a worldwide experiment with all the elections going on, on how do you balance yeah. the, the power of these tools to reach and connect with more people, 
versus you know the the potential misuse or or um, uh, errors that can come out of some of the systems. Right. I think it's going to be more important even now than ever that this will go to education system as well and how the kids are raised and that's how they're going to use that. So, yeah, the next question is, uh, we have two more questions and then we will uh, we will uh, close. Where are AR regulations most urgently needed? Which sectors you think? Healthcare, finance, creative arts? Uh, is the end goal to create a, a harmonized global framework or, I don't know, country by country? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think it, it depends on which policymaker you ask in terms of where regulations are needed most immediately. But, you know, I think you hear a lot of conversation about needing to regulate the use of AI, definitely healthcare and finance, also in employment related decisions, um, also in a lot of areas that already have um, sort of consumer product regulations, so like automobiles, for instance, um, if they're using AI to, to, to drive on the road. Um, you know, I think creative arts is, an, is another interesting one, though uh, I, I think a lot of the maybe shaping of, of regulations in that space or that, that impacts people in that industry could come from some of these court cases that are currently underway. Um, regarding copyright and how their how their works are used to train AI models. And as for you know a global harmonized framework, I mean, again, I think that depends on 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 who in the world you're asking as as to what that framework would look like or if it should exist. I mean, there's been a lot of different different efforts among some global leaders to to try to to start some sort of global kind of AI coordination. There's, of course, the the work between the U.S. and EU. Uh, there's the there was the U.K. AI Safety Summit. Um, Prime Minister Sunak tried tried to organize some coordinate coordinate there. Um, you know, there's I think some interest from from China also in setting some ground rules at the global at the global level. But but right now, I mean, there's a lot of different um, sort of things that are that are being worked on in different corners of the globe and so it's not it's not clear if that's ever going to turn into some sort of global ai regulatory body it's especially um you know difficult i think to to think about that happening when we haven't even seen policymakers land on a unified approach within their own countries across the many jurisdictions of the world i would i would add there is there is that there is a push from folks like Eric Schmidt, uh, for, you know, former Google chairman and and others for something like an IAEA for AI. Um, and you know, you've seen the UN start some of those conversations. But I think you're you know, the the uh, you know, the dragon in the room is China, um, you know, right. You know, they're they're going to want a certain approach. Both Europe and the U.S. are mostly looking at things through a national security and economic lens that. Um, currently is de-risking, if not decoupling from China. Um, so how do you balance some of this, you know, in a multipolar world where there's different actors and interests? Um, how does that play out? Um, you know, we'll, we'll see. Right. I think that the, this is very much connected to the last question that we have. Could you give some highlights about the policy debate regarding AI safety? Because you just mentioned that there is a debate around that already. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I think there's definitely a thought among many policymakers that the most advanced models need to be more regulated, and that's what we see in the AI Act. That's that was the thrust of the UK's AI Safety Summit, and uh, it was it's also the thrust of the executive order that President Biden signed, which is that that the that the leading edge models that can be most sort of dramatically used in these different domains from things to like bioweapons um, or um, sort of, you know, emo emotion recognition or things like that, like uh, that, that those need to be um, more regulated, that they, that they need more transparency, that there needs to be more exposure to to government regulators on those. So, so I think like that's the big picture when it comes to AI safety. Um, and of course, there's there are, there are lots of other avenues there. I think children and the impact of the digital world on children has been a big part of the tech debate in the last few years. And I think that that's going to spill into the AI space as children are using 
generative AI more and more. And as generative AI is worked into tech services and products and platforms and social media that children are already very invested in. Right. Thank you so much. This is the last question. And uh, I hope that uh, all our guests uh, enjoyed uh, listening to this uh, great insights and information that everybody get a little bit more knowledge and feel a little bit more, more confident in this uh, um, challenging environment that we are all in and everything is changing so fast. So um, thank you very much, Jeff and Kyle. It's been amazing to have you here to be our partner in this uh, journey. And we will keep um, doing this and helping people and and companies to get more knowledge and to feel more confident in their daily life. Thanks for having Thank us you. on for the great questions. Thank you. Have a great day, everybody.